Well, good chilly morning to you and happy 2022. Um, I'm Lisa Hubner, and I'm going to be bringing our announcements today. Jordan's preaching, so he'll be sharing with us here in a little bit. Um, whether you're here in person or online, we are just so glad to have you with us. And we do today, as we do every Sunday, gather to worship him, to be formed by him, and be sent by him. So good to start this new year with you this morning. A couple of announcements. We will be having a parenting conference January 14th and 15th. It will be held here in this building. Child care will be provided, and that's going to be a great opportunity just for us um, as families, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, anybody investing in a child's life. This will be a great fit for you. We'll have opportunities to break out, um, whether you're parenting younger children or teenagers, and hear from some people who are walking along in that season of life. So you can sign up at the information desk. We've got some more information about it back there or here at this URL. Oh, that is not there. It's 12thav.org slash parenting. Um, Grief Share is a group that we will be starting in cooperation with uh, Christ First Counseling Center. That is for anyone who has had a loss in their lives and would like to be part of a group. There's a curriculum that's 12 weeks. Um, one of our counselors from CFCC, Joey McLaughlin, will be leading that group. It will meet here at the church on Tuesday evenings, 6.30. And so you can go to the URL here, 12thav.org slash grief share to sign up for that. Um, our office will be closed tomorrow. That is our um, New Year's holiday um, observed. So the office will be closed. We will be back open normal hours on Tuesday. Um, if you need offering envelopes, they are available at the information desk um, in little groups of 12. So um, you can pick those up or you can grab them in the office anytime. The last announcement, as we start this new year, this is a great opportunity. If you haven't already connected to a life group, or a tryout or quad, um, we would love to help get you connected. Um, there's a URL here you can sign up. Our quads, as you know, just finished reading through the New Testament, which, hey, let's give ourselves a round of applause for that. That was a great experience, I think. So um, we do have a reading schedule. If your group would like to continue meeting this year, we have an Old Testament reading schedule available on the back counter there or we can get it to you. Um, we'll be sending that out via email as well. So if you'd like to continue meeting or if you'd like to jump into a triad or quad, we'd love to help you do that. I will get us started in prayer and then the worship team will join us. Father, it's so good to be together um, as a body this morning. Father, we thank you for a new year and all that that means, Lord, as we come to just um, reflect on your goodness in our lives. Lord, we know we come from all different places. We come, some of us, um, heavy-hearted with things that are too much for us to bear. Some are um, just walking through grief or pain. And Lord, we ask that you would be so present. Lord, for those um, in other seasons, Lord, whether that's joy or stress or uncertainty, God, just meet us each where we are this morning. Lord, we thank you um, that you don't leave us to do life alone, that you place us in family um, here in this body. And so, Father, help us look around this morning to one another and help us know how we can carry each other's burdens to you. God, we do want to worship you with our whole hearts this morning. We thank you um, for your goodness to us as we still reflect on what it means that Jesus Emmanuel came to be among us and live among us and show us how you um, desire relationship with us and you want to live a life of purpose and um, of knowing you. And so, God, we want to start our year that way this morning. Um, Father, as we worship you, as we learn from your word this morning, may everything we do and think and say bring glory and honor to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand with us? As uh, we finished up our reading this week, I don't know about you, but it left me with this excited expectation as we wait for Jesus' coming again. And the last words that we read said, Jesus, the one who says these things are true, says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
This morning, we want to especially welcome you and just let you know that we so much desire to be a community of Christ, not just at a brief time on Sunday morning, but throughout the week and in small groups and surrounding and encouraging one another. And um, there's an information desk in the back if you want to find out more about how you can truly be a part of this community as we seek to follow Christ.
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. The time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The just thank you um, for the opportunity for us to come together and, and sing that truth that you are great, just to um, declare it um, before you, that we, we know that that's true and we feel that in our hearts, and to uh, remind ourselves and each other of that truth. I just pray that you would open each of our hearts to be receptive to what you have um, to share with us through Garen and Jordan this morning, just that we would... Um, walk out of this place later this morning and sing that truth with our lives as well, that you are great and that we know that.
and that we live as though that is for, for that to be evident to everyone around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My Good privilege to do our missions moment again uh, this morning. Where did Garen go? I had a theological question for him. Oh, well, I'll ask him later. Do we have a picture of the Brinsons? Yes, there they are. Uh, Jesse and Tori Brinson uh, are with Call to Greatness. Tori is the daughter of uh, Jenny and Charlie Hoy, who have been a part of our church family for, for many years. Um, Called to Greatness is a ministry that focuses on reaching college students, high school students, and middle school students. And they are on several campuses here within um, the state and in the Kansas City area. Um, they oftentimes use sports as a, a platform for reaching young people. Um, Jesse has gone to Mexico, I think once or twice with our youth group to do some sports camps with the um, United in Christ ministry down there. And I know he has worked with um, some of the high school football teams and middle school teams in uh, Lawrence where they have lived for a number of years. A couple of years ago, um, Jesse was led to start working with Fort Scott Community College, their football program. Um, he was kind of a volunteer chaplain. And um, then it, the Lord opened the door for them to move down there last summer and uh, planning to stay in Fort Scott as long as the Lord had them there. And, um, but at the end of the football season, this fall, uh, Fort Scott Community College decided to close down their football program. So they are in the process of uh, asking God what, what his next step is for them. And so I want to just read um, a text that I got from Jesse yesterday um, when I, I mentioned that I'd be uh, speaking on their behalf. He says... We are believing for a clear vision for the spring of 2022. With the elimination of the football program, that changed our goals and vision quite a bit. Our new goals are to strengthen the relationship with the track coach and team and other students on the Fort Scott uh, campus. Our vision remains the same in seeing young people discover God, build a foundation of faith, and live a life of greatness, growing as disciples. In March, we will evaluate our relationships and connections and make a decision to stay or leave. Pray for our family as many of our adult friends have left Fort Scott, but, are, but we are developing new ones at the church we attend here in Fort Scott, Faith Church. So in a minute, um, Garen or Jordan will, will be praying about that. Um, Earlier this fall, I had an opportunity to uh, spend a, about a day and a half at, uh, in Fort Scott with the Brinsons. I, I wanted to just see um, what, what Jesse was doing down there, and so um, got to meet some of the football players that he works with, and uh, it, was, it was a great experience. And um, just about a month ago, at the close of, of the season, um, Jesse led weekly what they called character um, building sessions with the football players. And at the end of the season, um, I think maybe a local pastor presented and 13 of the football players um, made a decision to enter into a relationship with Christ um, that evening. So uh, a pretty, pretty neat thing that, that God was, is doing down there. Um, their kids, 
Zeb is their older son, Ayana and Isabel are their uh, two daughters. So, Garen, here's my theological question. Do we get an extra jewel in our crown for coming today since it's so darn cold? Yeah, two. Two? Actually, yes, two. So. Okay, good. Good to know. Scott, and they do have a significant ministry. I went with Scott, Pat and I went with Scott and Kathy several years ago to their annual uh, kind of the big banquet and stuff, and it's really impressive the ministry they're having. And I also appreciate him reaching out to Fort Scott like he does. When we took students to Urbana three years ago, um, kind of in the 80s and 90s, a lot of campus ministries had to leave small campuses and left a lot of smaller campuses without a, a strong Christian witness. And so the fact that they are working there is really, really exciting. So we do want to take a moment to pray for them, specifically for yeah, for that ministry, the decision that they're going to have to make for God's guiding and that, because um, he did have a really big impact. I've talked to him a couple times about what he was doing with football players, and I really respected the impact that he was having. So, um, again, God's at work through our body, through people here, through the people that we support, and so um, that's why we leverage our our income for this, because we want to be a part of what God is doing, and we want to reflect his generosity Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, regarding our money, he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And so we who follow Jesus remember that, and we live that way, and we want to live with generous spirits. And just remember that part of our worship is in our giving. So we'll take this moment, like always, to, to pray for the Brinsons, um, to give people online that chance to give. Again, if you're visiting with us, you're visiting online, That's uh, this is a, a family activity. Um, but do take this time to pray um, for them. A couple other things. I know the, the Ann Liker's granddaughter, Adeline, who at only like five days old went in the hospital with some um, pretty serious problems. I think she's out. Is that right, Pat, now? Or she's been, huh? Possibly today. Um, she's not out of the woods. We can want to continue to pray for them. Their daughter, um, Danielle, so pray for the grandbaby, um, Adeline, for the just the whole family with that. Um, that's not a fun thing to go through in the holidays. And then just think of Daniel Buller, who's um, recovering from a pretty strong bout with pneumonia. Um, so we want to be in prayer for him. And any other needs that you know, that are things on your heart, things that are that you know in the body. And and then if you would, I mean, I know, I hope you don't sit, your, watch your watch like, oh, 10 seconds to go. Because I do a minute. Um, Let's open ourselves and our heart up to what God has to say, because we're going to be in his word at the end of Revelation, and it's a really profound, powerful text, but uh, I think when you get to the end of Revelation, God shatters a lot of what we think about eternity. Um, we'll get to that in a minute, so we want to be open to what his word has to say, because we want to be people of the word, right, who know the word and who are what we believe about God and everything is shaped by the word. So let's take that minute and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you even on a very cold day that we we are able to gather publicly because um, we know people in places around the world who can't do this and whose lives are a great danger if they do this. So we're thankful that even when it's cold and icy that we just have that freedom. So this morning as we end off our year in the New Testament and we come to the very end of Revelation, Father, um, there's just so some profound truths that you have there. And so, Lord, um, we just want to have open ears to hear. We want to have open eyes to see. We want to have 
hands and feet that want to take and apply and do. And so, Lord, we um, give thanks for you and your word, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Jordan, come on up. Um, this morning, Jordan and I are doing this together because we're hitting an interesting text, and so I wanted somebody that if you were like, what in the world are you guys talking about? You'll have somebody to text and call and talk to so that Jordan is, it's all him today. So um, if you could lean on him, if uh, <laughs> whatever. We are going to be in Revelation 21 and 22. I'm really excited. Before we jump in, a uh, couple of quick things. Again, we, we're done with our New Testament reading. If you're wanting some of the triads and quads are still meeting, small groups that are wanting to continue in the Word of God. We've got the Old Testament reading plan in, in the back on this kind of cream-colored paper. You don't have to be in a group to do that. If you are wanting a way to help you be in the Word every day, then this reading in Genesis is excellent. One other thing, it's the beginning of the year. I always like to do an end-of-the-year evaluation of my life and where I'm at with the Lord and where I'm at with things and... So I have, in fact, somebody texted me Thursday and was like, hey, do you have, we, I want to do that, do that thing or do an evaluation. So on the, the very back on your way out, I do have something that you can work through that just helps you think about your heart and where you are with God. So you can, um, you can grab one of those things on the way out. Um, so just want to let you know about that. So today we're going to talk about a really interesting topic, a thing, topic that probably all of us are interested in to some degree, I mean probably all of us, um, which is about heaven. You ever think about heaven? Um, I mean, I think we all do at times. There are a lot of misconceptions about heaven. I think in our culture, I remember when I went to a funeral in Texas with my, um, where an uncle had died, and as I heard my relatives talk about heaven, there were, it was really clear to them, it was just a big party, family reunion in this cool place, and like God was just not even there. He kind of built it, and he, he managed it, but he wasn't there, and it's just a place to hang out and eat with family forever. And it was just interesting to hear them to talk about that. I think even a lot of, in our culture, there's just so many I, false <laughs> ideas about heaven and the future that I think even we as believers can buy into some of that without thinking about it. So that's what we want to talk about is that intermediate state, heaven. Um, the Bible doesn't say a lot about it, but... Jordan and I want to talk, to set this up before we get to Revelation 21 and 22, we want to talk about six key things we think you need to know about heaven, and here they are. So Jordan, you jump in with the first two. Yeah, yeah our first two both um, come out of Luke 23, so Luke 23, 43, when Jesus is on the cross and he's speaking to the thief next to him and he says... Truly, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. So um, the first thing we can ascertain is that it's a place of paradise, right? It's a place with no more junk, with no more struggling, with no more suffering, with no more pain. And it's a place where your soul is at ease. And it's clear that, that Jesus is talking about heaven in this, in this spot here on the cross. So the first thing we can see is that it is a paradise. It is a place where the struggle of earth and earthly things is over. The second thing is that we're there instantly. That same passage he, he says today. He says, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me. So it's, it's not like you die and then you're waiting and then you take a number and you get to go. Like instantly when we're absent, and you'll talk about this, but when we're absent from our body, we're present with the Lord. And so, um, and so for the believer, the instant your soul leaves your body, we know that we're present with God. And it's not like this waiting around thing. So um, yeah, the first two, that it's paradise and that we're, we're there right away. Okay, and I'm going to hit the next two. And just a quick, these are, there's a lot of scripture that relate to these. We just picked some that kind of hit all of them or hit all of these. So this, the third one is, he just mentioned, Paul clear, is clear in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that, that when we die, we, be, we are absent with the body and we're immediately present with the Lord. And so it's very clear that heaven is not a place where your body is. It's a place where your soul goes to be with God. Sometimes in funerals, you're, you'll hear people talk as if, You'll be like, well, that leg they had broken, they're running around and they're fine. But in heaven, it's just your soul. Your body stays where it is, it, it decomposes and all of that. But it's really clear that to be in heaven is to be absent from the body. Today on the way to church, Maggie asked if the people in the cemetery or buried were extra cold today. Yeah, that's and a so good we question. we had to have a talk. About, I had to, you know, at 9 in the morning, I had to break out 2 Corinthians 5 on her. So it was, I didn't do that. What's the answer? 
<laughs> oh Probably. We'll go and go there. And then I think the fourth thing that we'd like to, that I think is really, this is really, really important to me, is the, that heaven is primarily about presence, not about place. I'm not saying it's not a place, but like the way my relatives talked about it, it was this really cool place with no pain where they could hang out with family forever, right? And God wasn't there. I could show you dozens and dozens of scripture that talk about that the, the most important part of heaven is the presence of God, being present with him. It's about the relationship with him. He's the core of it. He's the most important part. Um, and Psalm 1611 talks about that, where David, talking about being forever with God, says, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So the presence is more important than the place, okay? Place is important, but presence is the most important thing. So it's not a physical place like the James Webb telescope isn't going to look into deep space and be like, oh, I think we can see heaven. That's not happening. Yeah, and that's not going to happen. Dang, so. I was really hoping that's what that's <laughs> that Someday yeah. they'd see it. Yeah. Okay, number five is that praise and worship are going on in heaven. Um, in Revelation 4 and other places, it's really clear that at the throne of God, there is worship happening. We see winged creatures. We see angels, um, and they're worshiping God. And in Revelation 4, it, it says they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Almighty who was and is and is to come. Um, and so it's really clear that at the throne of God, there is worship and there is praise taking place day and night. Um, and, and how could there not be? If, if you read about how splendid God is in his throne room, like how could you be in his presence and not be worshiping him? Yeah. So we know that that is an element of heaven. Awesome. And then you got one more. Wrap it up. Last one, number six. Yeah, is that there is joy everlasting. So Psalm 1611 like you said, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So it's a, it's a place of joy. It's a place you want to be. Um, I'll, t I'll talk more about this later, but when I was young growing up. I knew a lot of things about heaven, but one thing I wasn't sure of is if I wanted to be there or not. Like, I don't know about this place. We're worshiping forever. It sounds kind of weird to me. So, But Psalm 1611 assures us it's a place that, that we want to be. So it's a place of, of joy. Yeah. And isn't all that awesome? I mean, and you know, you always heard people as they're older, they keep talking about they're looking more and more to being in heaven with God. And the older I get, the more I kind of understand that. So, so let me, uh, but we're, we wanted to hit heaven for a minute, but we're really going to focus on Revelation 21 and 22. And before we get there, I, I want to, I need to set up a couple of things because we're talking about heaven right now. And if you read in Revelation 4, which he just referenced, you see heaven is the throne room of God and God's at the center of everything. When you get to Revelation 15, you see another snapshot of heaven. The throne is still there. God is there. And you see believers who have died are there with him. So you see heaven in Revelation 4 and Revelation 15. But when we get to Revelation 20 and 21, there is a shift that happens. And we'll get there in a minute, so just be patient. Um, and we're shown in Revelation 21 and 22 where we will spend the rest of eternity. Um, and I need to tell you my story a little bit because I grew up, you guys know, I right? I grew up unchurched, but we live in a culture that talks about heaven, that believes in heaven. And the thing I always thought from what I heard is, is you die if you were good, right? You go to heaven. If you were bad, you go to hell, right? And then when you get to heaven, we're like, we got wings and we're floating around and we have harps and we're singing. I mean, that's really what I thought. And you're just forever floating around with harps and singing forever and ever. That was kind of my vision. After I became a believer and I was reading through the Bible and I read the book of Revelation, when I got to Revelation 21 and 22, I was so shocked that the view of the end of the Bible of where we spend eternity was not that view and was totally different. And I'm like, why do people believe we're like have wings and floating in heaven forever and ever? That's not what the Bible says how it ends. And I was really shocked by that. And so as we're going to see in a minute, where the Bible ends is actually on new creation on a new earth. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons. There's a lot of reasons, but not a lot of churches talk about new creation. But it is a very, very biblical doctrine, and it's really important. And we want to be Brians at 12. We want to be people like the Brians who are eager to learn the word and everything we've ever believed or everything we hear, even from us, we check it with Scripture. And so this morning... I, when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, I'd like to challenge you to come to the text as if it's new and just to hear it for what it says, because I think we bring so much of future beliefs into it and onto it. I just want to hear, let, want us to hear it for what it says. So before we get there, I want to dive in on one more thing. There are a lot of references in the Bible to new creation. Again, it's something a lot of churches don't talk about. It's a, there's a lot of them in the Old Testament. The most primary are actually in Isaiah 65 and 66 
Or in Isaiah 65, 17, the Lord says, See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. In Isaiah 66, 2, the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me. So the Jews were expecting when the Messiah came and judgment happened, he would create a new heavens and new earth. That's what they expected. And it's in the New Testament. In 2 Peter 3, 13, we just read this about a month ago. Um, Peter says, in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So this concept of new creation is really important in Scripture. And it's what Jesus had in mind in Matthew 19 when he's speaking about his eventual return and to sit on his throne forever. He says, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne. So he's saying, at the end, I'm going to renew all things. We've talked about this before, right? He's going to renew, like, some things or how many things? He's going to renew all things. And Peter talks about it, that Jesus must remain in, in heaven till the time comes for God to restore how much of all this stuff? Everything. And Colossians 1 talks about that through Jesus, God is going to reconcile all things. But Jordan, that Matthew one is really significant. When yes. Jesus says, when I'm on my throne, I'm going to renew all things. Um, dude, I want you to like wax poetic on this because that, that text is extremely significant. So yeah, tell us why that's so important. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm slow to uh, highlight things in my Bible. I don't know why, but I am. But this is highlighted for me. And if Matthew 19, 28 is not highlighted or underlined, or some kind of footnote, like it needs to be noted in your Bible because this is like the crux of it. This is so important. So in your Bible, Matthew 19, 28, when Jesus says, truly I tell you at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne. This is huge because that word that he, he talks about, the renewal, it's this Greek word called palingonesia. And that means nothing to you if you don't know what it means. Um, but, if you, but if you know what those two Greek words means, this is like a jaw-dropping moment for you. And we're going to talk about it in one sec because when I learned about this, like I was well into my job here at 12 before I really, someone explained this to me. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's what Jesus is really talking about. It was a huge turning point for me. So can you say palingonesia in church? I don't know. That's Oh, is it not allowed? I, may, I mean, just the word. Palingonesia? Yeah, is it okay? I think so. Okay, I just want to make sure it's not in dirty I hope. That's Did all... I curse in Greek no, or something? Yeah. Did you play a trick on me? <laughs> no, and that's how we're starting 2022? Yeah. No, so palingonesia, it's one of these compound words that really is two things. So palin meaning again, and genesia, you can see uh, how that could mean genesis or beginning, right? It sounds a lot like that word. So the beginning again. So Jesus says when things begin again, when it is genesis again, and I am sitting on my throne. And you just, you know that he's talking about bringing heaven down to earth, restarting the Garden of Eden. Um, it's this new creation language. It's not forever on a cloud up in heaven. It is the renewal of all things. It is Genesis happening once again. God walking in the garden with us physically. Um, and it's so exciting that that's what he's talking about. Yeah, that's, I think that's super profound. And if you think about it, this actually makes sense. If you think about the story of God, that he's going to, it's going to be the renewal of Genesis. It's going to be beginning again, the Eden again. We'll get to that in a minute. But here's why it's significant. Because when he created Adam and Eve, they were in bodies living on the earth. And if they had never sinned, and they had only eaten from the tree of life, which would have given them forever life. They would have lived, and their descendants, and you know their children, and us, without sin. We would have lived forever and ever on that new earth. So we were created to live in bodies on earth. That's how we were created. So it actually makes sense that in the end of everything, when Jesus comes back, that he's going to make a new creation. So I think it's time for us to get back, to, to get to Revelation 21. Um, and we're going to have somebody come up who's going to read scripture for us. You come on up. Hey. Yeah, Nate, come on up, because I'm going to, as you're walking, I'm going to say something, and I'm going to grab. So before, he's going to read Revelation 21, 1 to 22, 5, and before we get there, um, let me just set it up a little bit, if you don't mind. I want to show you that there is a shift that happens regarding in heaven and earth, because again, Revelation 4, you see heaven, the throne of God. Revelation 15, the throne of God is in heaven. Believers who've died are up there. And then we're going to see a shift. And what we see happening in Revelation 19 and 20 is that Jesus, the, there's this millennial period, whatever you want, however you want to define that, there's this millennial period. Jesus returns to earth. When he returns finally, he is going to resurrect every human being. He will resurrect all people, the dead, put their bodies and souls back together. There will be judgment. 
And at the end of chapter 20, it talks about that those who don't have a relationship with him through Jesus, it talks about their final end. And then in Revelation 21 and 22, which he's going to read, it talks about the final place where those who know God through Jesus will be. So you've got him returning, that millennial him returning, resurrection, the final judgment, and then everybody in their final place. And so let's jump in and let's hear, for those who know Jesus, what's that final place going to be? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he dwelt with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is said, seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water, without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murders, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be co-signed to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls <clears throat> full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. Um, on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were names from the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide, measured the city with the rod, and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, Ninth, topaz, the tenth, turquoise, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night, 
there will be no need there will not they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the lord god will give them light and they will reign forever and ever and then verse 6 of chapter 22 says the angel said to me these words are trustworthy and true these words are trustworthy and true the Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Nathan, good job. Thanks, Thank Nate. You. And if anybody understood all that, could you email me later and tell me? Because <laughs> I have some questions. And this is the word of the Lord that we just heard. So can we say amen to that? Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so well, here's what we want to do. Um, if you were here last week when I talked about the book of Revelation, the way the kind of literature it was is the, the one of the main things I told people last week is, is when you read it, don't get so lost in the details that you miss the big picture. And so we want to really hit this morning when we talk, we're going to look at six things that we learn about new creation from this text. All right. And those are to us are the really big rocks. There's a lot of small details in here. And if you've got questions about those, Jordan and I are going to do it. Q&A next summer, I think, some oh, Sunday night yeah. with Mountain Dew and pizza, right? Yeah, and the good pizza, Yeah, not the cheap stuff. And Dr. Pepper, too, it right? It would be Papa John's, but my wife doesn't like Papa John's, so I'm not allowed to have it either, so <laughs> something else. Oh, they went out of business, too. Never mind. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, But we do want to hit the six big rocks. So, yep, we do. Um, here's the first one. The first one, really, it's, it's kind of implied, but it really, it's not implied. It comes out of Revelation 20 that before Jesus does all of this stuff in 21 and 22 is he does resurrect the dead and people are sent to their final place. So we will be on this earth with resurrected bodies, our body and souls put back together, okay? It's not floating around with spirit wings in heaven. That's not the idea that we are, our bodies and souls are put back together. And this is all in the Bible. As This year, especially as we read through the New Testament, I marked all the times it talked about our future resurrection. It is a really, really important doctrine. The Apostles' Creed talks about, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. But we don't talk about it so much. And I think we have our culture's idea of just floating in heaven forever. And we don't have this idea of how important our body is and that we were created to be a body and a soul. So that's the first thing is we're in resurrected bodies living on earth. Yeah, second thing is that we are actually here on earth. And in the first verse of Revelation 21, it makes it clear. It says, I'm making... A new earth. And so, like you said, we're not up in heaven, floating, unsure where we are. We are here on this new earth, and God is here with us. Yep. And again, I mean, that was his intent for Adam and Eve. That's what he, we wanted, is that they live forever um, in that state on creation. Third thing that we have is that, and this is really significant, that heaven is coming down to earth. Okay? In Revelation 4, the throne of God is up in heaven, right? Revelation 15, the dead believers, their souls are in heaven. Revelation 15, we're the throne of God. But suddenly, we see heaven coming down. So look at verse 2 of chapter 21. Verse 2 says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So it's coming down to the earth. Look at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So that, that whole new Jerusalem, in fact, we, in Revelation, I mean, not Revelation, Hebrews 11, we read multiple times like Abraham and Moses that they were looking for, forward to that great city, the true city. Okay, that when they died, their soul was in that true city in heaven, but eventually that true city comes down to earth. And then look at chapter 22, verse 3, um, after the first sentence, it says, this is really significant. Because again, in Revelation 4, Revelation 15, the throne of God is in heaven up there. But it says in chapter 22, verse 3, the throne of God and the Lamb will be, will be where? What's it say? If you have your Bible open, it will be where? In the city. And that city has come down to earth. And again, in, if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 22, where it talks about that there is a river of the water of life that's there, as clear as crystal, and that river is flowing from the throne of God, the throne of God that's in the city, the city that has come down onto earth. So that's the third thing that we learn, is that heaven comes down to earth. A really great way that's depicted, too. If anybody watches uh, the Gospel Project, their YouTube videos, their video on heaven and earth is so good at this because it's... It explains it so clearly. It's just this Venn diagram where things come together. And in that video, they're talking about Jesus' presence on earth, but it gives you this clear picture of what it will look like when heaven and earth are put together again. 
And for me, it was really easy to understand. So Gospel Project, Heaven and Earth, if you want to watch a good video about that, it's, it's really excellent. And what I love, if you don't mind, about this yeah. heaven come down earth is finally, this is the realization of Jesus' prayer where he prayed, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So it's the final realization of actually his prayer. All right. Yeah. Number four is that God and Jesus are present with us. They're front and center on the new earth. Um, so if you look at Revelation 21, verse 3, and then also verse 22, and then in 22, verse 4, this language of them being physically with us is so clear. They, the, the text says they'll be among us. They'll be with us. It says that twice. It says we'll see them face to face. And so, like Aaron said, this was always God's intent was to be physically with us. Um, hearkening back to Genesis 3 when it says the man and the woman, they walked in the garden alongside God. We see that this was his original plan before things went awry. Even in Matthew 1 when, when the name of Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, that his desire was always to be with us. And there's also this language that there'll be no temple or no church building in new creation, right? Yeah, and first I, 22 I of think chapter that's, 21. You said it was 21, 22? Uh-huh. And I, it, it's literal that there won't be one, but I think the imagery of that is really important too, right? Because it's, it's talking about the fact that God's presence is not um, limited to one space, And it's not like it needs to be coming through any specific channel anymore. It's like God's presence is everywhere. Not that God's presence is just in our church either, but it's it's just reaffirming this idea that his 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 presence, his light, his goodness is everywhere. You don't need to go to a certain place to feel closer to him. He will be all over, all the time, omnipresent. It'll be obvious, and he will be uh, physically with us. Yeah, I love that because it says that there's no temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are that temple in verse 22. That's really powerful. So God and Jesus are present. They're front and center on earth. And then the fifth thing is, is that actually it is a return to Eden. Um, And you see this, it's actually implied if you look at chapter 21, verse 1, because it says, I saw a new heaven and the new earth. And when you read that, you immediately think of Genesis 1-1, when God created, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is taking that exact same language, and it's beginning this section of new creation with those same words. So again, it's taking us back to Genesis, to that vision of Genesis, and back to chapters 1 and 2, which is how God designed and created everything. So if you look at chapter 22, flip to chapter 22 with me, or if you're in your phone, chapter 22, um, I want to read verses 1 to 3, because this is so full of Eden language. And it's so clear that God is taking us back to, again, Palin, Genesea, back to Eden, back to Genesis, back to the beginning. So chapter 22, it says this, I, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Um, if you remember in Eden, there were four rivers. That idea of the rivers flowing out of the center of Eden was important. Now it's just one river, but I, the river of the water of life is clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, which we first see in Genesis 2, right? Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be any curse. Where did we first see that word in the Bible? In Genesis 3, because of the sin, the curse comes. So this is all language that God is reversing the curse, the things that brought all the brokenness, darkness into this world, so it's not how he intended it that he's he's recreating the new heavens and the earth, and it's going back to what he intended in Eden. Um, In fact, Revelation 22, 14 says this, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. So this idea of back to Genesis, the tree of life is there, that we get to finally eat that fruit is really significant. And here's what I really think personally is cool about all this. If, if it is this palingencia, if, if how he designed us, that we're living on earth and he's fully present and it's back to, to Eden, how he intended it to be. Um, what I really think is cool is, uh, is the movie The Wizard of Oz. I mean, we all know The Wizard of Oz, right? We're from Kansas. If you're from Kansas, you know that. I mean, how many, when you go out of town, people ask you and they learn, hey, you're from Kansas, like, uh, do you know Dorothy or, or do you have a dog named Toto? Have you, have you guys all not heard that a hundred times, right? Um, I was watching, Pat and I were watching a documentary on the making of The Wizard of Oz recently. It is the most quoted reference movie by other movies in history. So other movies reference it or quote it a lot. And I was watching a director, a very famous director, talking about it. And he said the reason the story is so great is he said every great story does what Oz does. 
He says they begin and they end in the same place. It begins in Kansas, it ends in Kansas, which is heaven, right? I mean, we all know that here. People who drive through don't think that, but we who live here know that this is heaven. But that whole idea, the, every great story begins and ends in the same place. That's exactly what's happening here, that this new creation is this return to Eden. So I just, I think, I love the idea. I think it's we, pretty cool. We had cool. talked about that before this. And so I'd been thinking all week about like different shows or movies that I love that do the same thing. If you've seen the show Lost, the show Lost, which was wildly popular a while ago, does the same thing. The movie Memento, which got won a ton of awards and, and was really highly reviewed, does that. And Saving Private Ryan, which is one of my favorites, does that too. So the more you think about it, the, the movies that I love, the shows that I love, they do that too. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. The sixth thing is that all things will be made right. Um, in Revelation 21.4, we see this language, in it, and it syncs up with what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 65. So if you want to turn there, you can, but I'm going to read it for you. In Isaiah 65, 17 through 19, this is what the prophet says in his vision. He says, see, I will create new heavens and new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever, and in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and, a, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. So these two books of the Bible, even though they're written so long, so, so, uh, it's early in the morning, we're only doing one service. <laughs> they weren't written close together in time, and yet they sync up perfectly with this vision. And if you've read um, All Things New, I think that's what it's called, All Things New by Eldridge, he talks a lot about this, that all things will be made right and just all the ways that that's true for us, that, you know, misunderstandings that have happened will be corrected. Injustices that have happened on us and on larger scales will be corrected. Every sacrifice that you made for the kingdom, every time you had to miss out on something for the, for the greater good of the kingdom, that will be paid back 10 times over. Um, every time your story was was misunderstood, well, your story will now be told rightly. You'll be vindicated in that. And so he does a great job of fleshing out exactly what this means, but it's just this idea that everything's going to be made right. Every time that, that we've lost something for the sake of Jesus, it's going to be paid back 10 times over, and um, it's going to be worth it in the end. Yeah, I love that that new that language of made right in verse 4, where he's quoting Isaiah. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And in verse 5, he says, I'm making everything new, everything. Do you not long for that day when everything will be made right? No more pain, no more death, no more crying. So, powerful vision. That's, so that's what we learn from Scripture about new creation. Um, and here's what, again, kind of the whole Wizard of Oz. Here's what I want you to see. Um, oh, look, I forgot to do the Wizard of Oz photo in there. Man, I spent all that time on that, and then I missed my cue. Uh, but here's what's so cool is, is that we start at the beginning with original creation. I did the story of God in my first year here, like in the first few months. We start with original creation, and the story ends up with new creation, back to where we started. Um, and I think that's so powerful. And what we see in Revelation 21 and 22 is what we see is, is that heaven comes down to earth as God intended. And so God's vision of eternity is so much greater than ours. Because again, our culture's vision, which really comes a lot from Greek philosophy, to be honest, of floating in clouds with wings and harps and all of that forever and ever, kind of disembodied spirits, it's not the biblical vision. Here is God's vision. It is everything we love about heaven, these six things about heaven. He's gonna, those things are going to be added and part of new creation, and we're going to have both of those things together. Everything true of heaven will be true in this new creation, and the things we dream of with heaven, it's so much better than we imagine. It's not going to be this floating around with wings. It's going to be living on new creation, and I just think that's so powerful, and that combo to me is, um, is just so powerful, and, that's, and it just captures my heart. Um, in a minute, we're going to get to why we think that so. So really, here's the vision of, I've shared this before, but here's the vision of the Bible of what life and death looks like. So here I am alive. I've, I've got a body and a soul. I'm living on creation. Someday I will die. And when I do, my family will put my body in the ground, right? But at the point of death, Scripture says, immediately my soul goes up to heaven and is present with God. And I'm in joy. You know, there's joy in that presence. I'm immediately there, but I'm absent from my body that when Jesus finally returns, his final return, he will resurrect the dead 
um, that my soul and body will be put back together, there will be final judgment, then he will create a new heaven and earth, and that's where we will live for eternity, is in that new creation. Not forever and ever floating in heaven, but forever and ever on new creation. So to me, that's exciting, and it gives me a lot of hope. Um, again, it's better than, than anything our culture's ever dreamed up or thinks about heaven, in my opinion, the eternal state. Yeah, this idea of heaven, it really, it kind of blows our minds because it's not what we're used to thinking about. And I know for me, it blows up the box that I had put God in. I had thought, okay, let's just try and quantify heaven so I know what to expect. But when we do that, maybe out of a need for control, for me at least it is, it's like you miss so much because God's plan is so much bigger. Um, and my story of learning about new creation, it's, I don't know, maybe it's similar to some of you. I grew up in a Christian school. Um, I remember Mrs. Oshke every morning in first grade would take us through like the Bible, like the big picture cards of we'd learn Bible stories. And I don't remember any of them except for the heaven one. And I remember it because it kind of freaked me out. But she would go through, and it was kind of this idea of what it says biblically about heaven and new earth. It was kind of blended into one. And at the time it made sense, but now looking back, it's like, man, those were different things because, you know, it would talk about how we were going to worship God forever and how there would be no sun or moon or light because God was our light and the streets of gold and the pearly gates. And so I had this really simplistic, like, kiddish idea of heaven that I thought was real. And I thought that's what the Bible said about it. I didn't look any more into it. And, I mean, I grew up in church. I went to Bible college. I worked in a church in a while before I was able to have this explained to me biblically and see what it really means and have a much clearer understanding of it. So I guess part of why I'm saying that is like if you have walked in here today and followed Jesus for a lot of years and not had an understanding of what Matthew 19 is really talking about, don't feel like a dummy. Don't feel like you're out of the loop. Like I was there as, as of up until a few years ago. And so it's so important that we, we really dig in and see exactly what the text says. But what's so exciting about this is um, a few things. One, I think that when you really understand what to expect in new creation, it's this quantifiable quantifiable end. It's this light at the end of the tunnel you can really see and look forward to. It's not like this ambiguous reward. Like, oh, I, I think heaven's going to be great one day. Um, at least I, I think it will be. So like, maybe I'll live for that. Man, when you know exactly what's waiting for you, it is so much easier to endure hardship, to endure temptation, to um, put kingdom before yourself because you know that that's waiting for you and you know exactly what reward is coming. And I don't know, for me, it changed it changed a lot about my walk with Jesus. It made it easier in a lot of ways. It made it more exciting and alive. And I don't know, it, it was big for me. So maybe it's big for somebody else too. Yeah, and part of the reason this is so big for me is because that idea that, again, comes from Greek philosophy of a disembodied soul living forever and ever floating around in heaven kind of thing is, is the, the new creation idea I love so much because all of the things I love, running in grass with my, in my bare feet, eating a pear, watermelon, not the fake candy watermelon, not that stuff, that's nasty. I mean the real thing, having watermelon, just um, hugging and embracing the people you care about because you have bodies and to give them a hug, to, to all of those things, to run and feel the wind in your hair, the things that I love about life are going to be a new creation. And so to me, that's what's exciting. And that's why Peter says in 2 Peter 3.13, he says, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. We're looking forward to that because that's going to be an amazing place. And so that's kind of a challenge for me is, am I looking forward to that? Do I have a full vision of where God's taking us? Am I excited about that? Yeah. Uh, another piece of language that Eldridge uses in his book, he talks about what is the anchor of your soul? Like, what is the thing that really grounds you that really, if it's the ultimate thing that drives you or that you're looking forward to, what is that? And he challenges you with that. And we just completed it with our life group. And it's, it's like, Wow. What makes me get out of bed in the morning? Am I really, like Second Peter 3, am I really looking forward to this, this thing God's going to do? Or am I just looking forward to, like, spring break or the Chiefs eventually losing the playoffs? Or, like, you know, what am I really excited for? Not too many people can identify with that one. But, um, but Jordan, you said the other day when we talked, you said something really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, something I think is really important that we talk about here um, as we switch out of Chiefs joke mode is that this is not a humanistic idea. Like a lot of what we've talked about here this morning does focus on what we will experience in new earth, but we want to make it so clear that it's not a humanistic idea, that we're not trying to take heaven and, and leave God out of it, um, because God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit 
are at the center of this, and it's because of them that this exists, right? They are the driving force behind it. They are the engine. They are the reason for it, and they are the lens through which we enjoy this, meaning that if God was to offer us Revelation 21 and 22 and then say, I'm not going to be there. You guys have fun, that in our hearts, if we're really following him, we wouldn't want it. Yeah. Like, it's not about the place. Yeah. It's about his presence, yeah, like you definitely. said. And so just keeping that focus, because even though this stuff is going to be awesome, and it's not wrong to look forward to the rewards that we have coming and the pleasures and the joy that God's got for us, it's not wrong to look forward to that. But to elevate it above the presence of God and want it without him is what we want to stay away from. So see it through the lens of it being a gift from him and it being a way to enjoy his presence. Yeah, and the focus of the text really is on God and the glory of God. Look at chapter 21, verse 11. It starts with these words, it shone with the glory of God. And then if you go to chapter 21, verse 23, for the glory of, at the end of it, or the middle, the glory of God gives it light. So the whole focus of this is God's glory and his fame. So we've been kind of talking about it from our perspective lens and what it'll be like for us, but he's the center of it and he's the most important thing. So let's not forget that. All right, let me, if, if you're like, like this is all new or uh, I just think it's so awesome, I want to really recommend Randy Alcorn's book, 50 Days of Heaven. Um, he wrote a longer book that's like 500 pages and probably nobody wants to plow through that about what the Bible says about heaven and especially about new creation. So if you want a book, um, I really, really recommend that to you. So, all right, let's land this thing, Jordan. How's this affect our lives. What, as we talked, what were our big application points yeah. of this? I think it's always important to answer the question, why do we talk about this? You might be sitting in your chair right now, like, why, why did we talk about this? Why was this an important thing to spend a Sunday on? For a few reasons. One, um, because a clear view of, of new earth and eternity, it encourages us to be steadfast in living for Jesus, right? Just like I said, that, that I can endure on earth when I know what the end goal is. And it excites me to be with him. And it makes me love him more and more that he would design that for me and have that for me. And it makes me want to live for him even more. So it encourages me to endure. It encourages me to be steadfast in my faith. That's the, that's the first thing. Yeah. And I, I said something this week. That I thought was really profound. I you just, didn't, but I did. I just kind of said it. And I thought it was kind of goofy and dorky. And, and Garen wrote it down. And he wanted to say it. But I, we were talking about just how cool new heaven and earth are going to be. And I said, wow, that's really out of this world. And then I was like, well, it's kind of in this world. And I thought it was kind of nerdy, but Garen really liked that a lot. Yeah, so I thought it was pretty cool. We had to but it's it, worth living for. And I mentioned last week in my sermon, the whole purpose of Revelation is those believers were being killed, persecuted for their faith, and they're like, what's going on, and should I continue in this? And the whole point of Revelation is be steadfast, hang in there, because this is what's coming. Vindication, God will win, a new creation. Yep. So, all right, you had a second The second one is that we can throw... Away our bucket list, right? I'm sure we've all got those things that we want to do before we die, and there's nothing wrong with that. I've got to go to Europe. I've got to this or this or this, and that's fine, but um, maybe this changes your view of that a little bit, where when you're in new earth, you have all those things. Like, I don't know if we realize, it talks about the cultures of the earth and the kings bringing their glory in. Like, everything that is here and that is good and beautiful about the earthly experience will be present in new earth. And so if you've always wanted to go see the Swiss Alps, but you know you can never afford it, like it's yours in new creation. If you've ever wanted to do something and, and you feel like you'll never be able to, like it's there for you in new creation. So maybe this discourages us from living our lives with this kind of bucket to-do list, like I've got to do these things because we know that God has them for us in new earth. So, And then my last thing that I really wanted to hit that I found really helpful is the whole idea of sharing your faith and evangelism. Because I, I have found with... I mean, just so many people that the idea of just disembodied floating in heaven with wings is really not very captivating to most people. And again, that's not the biblical vision. The biblical vision is, is ending life in a relationship with God, Him present, his presence coming down to earth. We're on this new earth, back in our bodies, worshiping him, but doing all the things that we love. And that thing captures people's imagination much more than the floating in heaven thing. And so I have found many times as I'm talking with people and they're wanting to know about eternity and all of that, that this actually is, is really helpful in sharing your faith with Jesus because people are really attracted to this story. And they, the ending of it is a good ending. And it's something that a lot of people are like, I, I'm not sure if that's true, but if that's true, I, I want that. I've, I've had a lot of those kind of things. So, all right, final challenge to everybody. So for believers, here's, here's as we talked about it. Um, 
to really, to imagine this, let this capture your imagination. Um, Jordan was even, when we were talking, he's like, to challenge you guys to take 5, 10, 30, I don't know, 30 minutes today and actually think about, read this text and think about what's eternity going to be like, not floating in heaven, but heaven coming to earth and us living on earth with the presence of God. Like, to think about that, let it capture your imagination and, and change the way you live and make you more anticipating his coming. Um, if you're still after this, you're not, I'm not sure, that's not what I really heard heaven is like, be a Berean, Acts 17, be eager to know the word, but everything that's said, you test it to scripture, um, go, to, go to Isaiah 65, 66, read the prophets, so many of the prophets talk about new creation, read Revelation 21 and 22, but just want to encourage you to really think about it, let it capture your heart. And if you're here, and you don't have that relationship with God through Jesus, here's my challenge for you. Um, kind of the end of chapter 21 says a pretty profound thing. It's chapter 22, I think. It says that nothing impure will enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only people that will be on new creation are the people whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're here today and you're like, I don't even know what that means, and I'm not even sure if my name's written in the book of life, that's the most important question you can answer. To leave here and not know if your name is in the Lamb's in Jesus' book of life is so important. So if you don't know that, grab one of us, grab a friend here or something and be like, I want to know what does that mean because I want to be there and I want my name written in that book. So that's our challenge to everybody. I'd like to close with the words of Revelation twenty two twenty, where um, Jesus says this, where it says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming. Yes, I'm coming. And it ends by saying, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Can you say that with me? Amen, Amen. Come, come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Is that not our heart's desire? So Father, we do look forward to this day. Thank you that um, your vision of what eternity is is so much more profound than ours. Um, I love the, the, what you're doing, how you're taking us back to, to recreation, how you're bringing everything right, that it's kind of back to Eden. And that is so beautiful and has captured my heart. I know as Jordan and I have talked, it's captured his heart. I pray that we would have a more full vision of what our eternity is going to be like. And so now we just want to take some time to finish by worshiping you um, again in song. And we pray, Jesus, we pray all this because of you and we pray it for you. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better way to end than to worship. So if you please stand with us. I love that um, towards the end of all this, too, it says, The Spirit and the Bride said, Come. Let the one who hears this say, Come. Let whoever is thirsty come. Whoever wishes may have the water of life as a free gift. It's that beautiful invitation to what they've been describing this morning, that Jesus wants us to come to be with him to get to spend that eternity with him. I think that part of that restoration, just that beautiful picture to me, is how we will get to worship in this way that it was meant to be. You know, as they were walking in the garden with God, as his presence filled the place and he was everywhere. We'll get to do that, Jesus. We'll get the, the praise and the glory and the honor that is due him.
see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see. not great is he not great yeah awesome all right 12th uh this is a message of hope and so this week again we live in a culture without much hope so you are sent to be people of hope because we know where we're going and we know what it's going to be like and it's better than you ever imagined so 12th you're sent 